I am very excited to introduce a wonderful panel on technology and innovation in medicine. Um, I can say with authority that the IQ on stage, uh, average IQ on stage has skyrocketed with the addition of these four. Um, just a couple of quick um, housekeeping uh, things I'm supposed to remind you of. If you're tweeting, which I hope you are, Trib Live is the hashtag. Uh, and if you're having any issues with the Wi-Fi, you can use the AT&T Wi-Fi network using the code printed on the Symposium program card. So uh, that should help you out if you're having any trouble. Um, we're going to do this panel a little bit differently. I'm going to introduce our four panelists, and then I'm going to invite them to, to talk to you briefly uh, individually before we have a moderated Q&A and then a conversation with the audience. So for starters, on my left, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brett Girard. He is the Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives for the Texas A&M University System, where he oversees research and innovation at the system's 11 universities and its Health Science Center. Uh, he's also the principal investigator for the Center for Innovation and Advanced Development and Manufacturing, a mouthful that is a public-private partnership with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, they do everything, including emergency preparedness against infectious diseases and uh, chemical and biological threats. Uh, next to Dr. Gerard is Nora Belcher, who's the executive director of the Texas eHealth Alliance, which is a nonprofit advocacy group. She started to give health IT stakeholders a voice in public policy. Uh, she was previously a health IT consultant and spent five years in Governor Rick Perry's administration as deputy director of the Office of Budget, Planning, and Policy. And next to Nora is Chad Shepler, who's the director of partnerships for DocBook MD, which is a HIPAA secure smartphone messaging application that allows physicians to collaborate securely and efficiently. Uh, he focuses on building relationships with medical societies, hospitals, and large group practices to streamline their interactions. And finally, John Mason is the Chief Information Officer for St. David's Healthcare and the Central and West Texas Division of HCA, the hospital company. Uh, he oversees eight acute care facilities, IT for eight acute care facilities and multiple ERs. Uh, he oversees all aspects of IT and planning for new technology, including 120 IT specialists, which if that's anything like the Texas Tribune, it's a handful. <laughs> so, um, so we'll start with Dr. Gerrar, and um, I know that he has a, a PowerPoint that should be up there. And um, feel free to go ahead and get us started. We're going to just have some sort of mini case studies about how innovation and technology has changed the, the, career, the careers and the industries of these four folks. So. Well, thank you, Emily, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Evan for the invitation, and particularly for Emily's email a couple days ago that says she would like about six or seven minutes of eye-opening new technologies in, in medicine. And uh, there's no better challenge for a person like me than to try to put that together. Uh, one thing I did put on the slide at first, it says, what the future promises if we can only dot, dot, dot. And what I would like to say, and, and I believe passionately, that technology is not the problem. We can solve almost any problem with technology, with the right programs, with the right incentives. The issues are, can we have the appropriate policy and ethical frameworks in which to implement those technologies? Can we afford those technologies? Can we pre create appropriate commercial incentives so they can be translated to the people? And very, very importantly, as my background as a pediatric intensivist in my first life is, can we create culturally and sociologically sensitive education and communication to populations who will ultimately benefit from these technologies? So while I'm talking all about technology, I think technology is the easiest part of the problem. My uh, bent on technology is a little bit different because I grew up in a standard uh, medical university at UT Southwestern with a standard molecular biology background, practicing pediatric critical care, but became involved in meningococcal disease, the college meningitis. Pretty soon after, I got a call from a Department of the uh, Defense, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in 1998 that was very interested in biological warfare. I spent 10 years working on programs with DARPA, spent five years at DARPA as the first MD office director, and a little bit about DARPA. DARPA was started in 1958, following Sputnik in 1957. It's a small organization, about 100 people. When I was there, we had a $3.2 billion budget. I had a $500 million a year personal checkbook. And it was all to take high risk, uh, high reward innovation for the country's benefit. And as an MD, I was there primarily because of the awful medical consequences uh, of the wars that we were fighting, uh, people coming back with traumatic brain injuries, lost limbs, amputations, et cetera, et cetera. So in addition to the rest of the portfolio, I became very involved in trying to innovate medicine in a way that, that probably could not be done. 
So my take on innovation has a lot of engineering, a lot of mathematics, a lot of physics, a lot of transdisciplinary kinds of things that I really think are the future of medicine and personally why I'm so excited about the opportunity here for the UT Medical School in Austin, given this environment, the semiconductor industry, the university, et cetera, it is wildly exciting. So the first innovation that we're working on that really is one that we're doing at Texas A&M System is I believe in the very near future we will have rapidly available global scale affordable vaccines and that will be imminent. And why is that such a problem? First of all, infectious diseases have been a problem for mankind you know, since the origin of multicellular life. We've had 500 million people die of smallpox in the 21st century. One third of the planet is infected with tuberculosis with a million deaths a year. The H1N1 outbreak in and of itself, although it wasn't quote severe, infected 24% of the world. It resulted in uh, 275,000 hospitalizations in the US and over 12 and a half thousand deaths. And why is that? Not because we couldn't make, know what the vaccine was, but because we couldn't manufacture it in time. We were using uh, technologies like the eggs that you see in 1960s, the same way we did it in 2013, and that's for a disease that we know how to take care of, influenza. What about the, and, and similarly like H7N9 that's there, what about the new coronavirus? What about all the new infections that are out there? So at Texas A&M, we were awarded last June by Secretary Sebelius, one of three national centers for innovation to basically take pandemic influenza off the table. We are responsible for providing 50 million doses of pandemic influenza vaccine within four months of notification. That takes about five months off the time. It will take pandemics off the table forever for the US. We're in partnership with Novartis in North Carolina and uh, a company in Maryland called Emergent. We were awarded $285 million with a $2 billion authorization for work. So this is a major severe center. It will result in about $41 billion of economic impact to the state of Texas. Now more importantly, will it not only uh, help infectious diseases, uh, but because it's driving low cost technologies, very, very low cost technologies, we're able to do things like we're working with MD Anderson and UT uh, uh, Austin right now on personalized cancer vaccines. The future, we're not gonna be giving chemotherapy. We're not gonna be doing all these massive kinds of surgeries. What we're gonna be able to do is train your immune system to kill the cancer on your own. That is not imminent, but that is very soon and there are clinical trials right now. I'd like to let everybody know that vaccines are not just for these things, but they're vaccines now uh, in the pipeline for addiction. We can vaccinate you against amphetamine abuse. We can vaccinate you against nicotine use. Those are very, very real and around the corner made possible by these technologies. And in the future, and this is much more in the future, but people are working on vaccines right now for things like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the plaques that deposit in your brain, they could be immunized against. So I want you to think of immunization and vaccine strategy as not something just against polio, but something that could really change the world by helping your body harness its natural healing powers against these great scourges. Uh, the next, which I think is a big innovation, is bionics, brain control bionics. This is something that we started when we were at DARPA for obvious reasons. We were saving 19 and 20 year olds who are coming back with no arms, and that's real, a real burden. Uh, the amputee in the military population is not the 80 year old with diabetes now, it's the 19 year old woman who comes back with no arms. So uh, Jeff Ling, who's up there, uh, was uh, the one who ran this program, and I know he's being recruited to the UT system, go get him. Uh, he is a neurointensivist, PhD pharmacologist, was on the president's neuro team, uh, started this program. Uh, the driver behind the program is this woman named Dawn Halfacker, who I met at Walter Reed Hospital. She was the point guard for the West Point uh, basketball team for four years. After she won her first Bronze Star in Iraq, then she had her right arm blown off uh, with an RPG incident, and she was sitting in the front row in every technical meeting, making sure that her needs were met as an individual. But bionic arms are there. They're in practice right now. These are naturally lightweight. They have all the movements of a natural hand. If you played piano before, you could play piano with it. And the brain control of that is now uh, first being implemented. A couple weeks ago, you see a woman there, quadriplegic, who fed herself with a robotic arm just based on brain control. First thing she wanted is chocolate. Seemed like a good decision to me. So, <laughs> so bionics are here, and they're here to stay. Stem cells. Stem cells, this is not a myth. This is not a fantasy. Stem cells and what they're going to do for medicine are absolutely phenomenal. I want to give you real people so you know this is not, I'm not a futurist. I'm, you know, a guy in the trenches like a lot of other people. Doris Taylor, who's now at the Texas Heart Institute uh, in Houston, she's only done a few little things like regrow an entire mammalian heart. Uh, this has been done now in rats and pigs, and she's working on human trials. 
We are now regrowing bladders, reimplanting them into people, but we are getting to the point in time now that we're going to be able to regrow entire organs, and some of that great work is being done here, particularly in Houston, and she is a superstar. Uh, suspended animation, another program that we started at DARPA. The world was rocked in 2005 by Dr. Mark Roth at University of Washington. Great personal story, was an orphan in Hershey's boys' home, uh, became a great scientist, and in 2005 he reported in science by giving hydrogen sulfide in the right quantities, he could put a mouse and then a rat into suspended animation. They lowered their metabolic rate to 5% of normal, they dropped to room temperature, and then six hours later he woke them up and they were all fine. Now we were obviously interested in that and could justify the work at DARPA because when somebody's shot in Baghdad or in Afghanistan, you don't have a medevac right there. So can we put people in suspended animation for a few hours to bring them back? Now think of our healthcare system. Um, and these are not mythical. These are now in clinical trials in phase two for things like uh, coronary artery bypass. But the concept is in a few years, if you uh, have sudden death on the side of the road, sure you can get CPR defibrillation, but you'll be put into suspended animation until you get to a hospital. If you have a stroke, you'll be doing that. Uh, if you have any kind of injury like that, this is not so you could be transported to Mars or something. This is, <laughs> this is just to give you a few, a few hours so you can get to definitive medical care and again, if you can do that and eliminate uh, massive uh, strokes, massive heart failure, heart attacks, not only is it great for you, but it's going to lower our cost. Um, even invasive high-tech things will be done at home. Right now, about 7% of people uh, who have chronic renal failure get home peritoneal dialysis. Um, it was just shown, and you may not see it on the slide, but there's now even a home hemodialysis machine uh, made by Dean Kamen. I was just with him on Friday. Uh, that's been tested in Canada. So these dialysis centers that cost billions and billions and billions of dollars a year, a year, it's shown that people can plug in at home, do home hemodialysis, and be done with it. And I give this as an example because if we can do hemodialysis at home, all the things you heard about this morning like telemedicine and home diagnostics and transcutaneous uh, diagnostics of your sodium and glucose, these are all incredibly doable. We're talking about that. I put another DARPA program up on the, on the right that's still not ready for prime time. It's gone through twice, not ready yet, but we tried to do not remote uh, telemedicine, but remote surgery. We developed robots to do surgery, so a person is on one end of it and you're getting operated on, why can't you do that across 1,000 miles? So that, why can't you do it in West Texas if there's no neurosurgeon? Why can't you operate from the middle of uh, UT San Antonio and do it on the battlefield? So the technical challenges are no longer in simple telemedicine. We're talking about telesurgery with no human there done completely uh, ro robotically with a person on the other end of it. That's where the tech challenges are. It's not on the simple things that we talk about. Um, again, I was with Dean Kamen as my last two slides, but I think this is, this, this is just gonna rock. And this was at the World uh, Economic Forum, I think Clinton's forum, that they announced this. But Dean Kamen has just created a combination of something called a Stirling generator and a water purification system that will be able to make 1,000 liters of pure water a day out of sewer, out of urine, out of everything for a penny a liter. Um, now, there's gonna be a big announcement sometime soon with a major corporation that has a lot of bad raps and deserves some of it uh, to disseminate this worldwide to create clean water at ultra low cost energy. This generator runs on cow dung, runs on anything, and runs for 20,000, 30,000 hours with absolutely no, no input from it. So we're now entering the stages that some of the big global health problems will be sound, f uh, found. Last thing I'll say, and I love this slide because it kind of epitomized the way I look at technology. Uh, nothing against newspapers, but the New York Times on, on one day said, you'll never make a flying machine. It'll take millions and millions of years and all the mechanicians in the world. And uh, on that same day, Orville Wright in his, in his diary started, we started assembly today. And, and, and I think we have to have that attitude about technology. And I think we have unbelievable opportunities to do that, particularly in Texas, particularly in the US. But again, I'll leave this, and I know the questions are coming, is technology is not the problem. It's can we create the policy, the ethics, can we fund it, can we make it economical, can we teach people how to use that technology, because in terms of technology itself, there is no limit. Thank you. So I am what's colloquially known as a policy geek or policy wonk, depending on what word you want to use. And when I got Emily's email, I started thinking about the other panelists that we were going to hear this morning, and the frustration that I heard as I was sitting through the presentations about social determinants of health. Well, what are we gonna do about this? What are we gonna do about that? What about the patient? Do we really medicalize everything? And so what I'd like to spend the next few minutes doing is talking about my absolute favorite quote right now. 
Patient engagement is the blockbuster drug of the 21st century. This is from a very, very smart man named Leonard Kish. He blogs at hl7standards.com. You can Google the article. It's completely amazing, but not while I'm talking, after I'm done. <laughs> I want to talk about technology and patient engagement. Because as I was listening this morning, I was making some notes about some of the things that I heard about where we are as a society. We are sedentary, big gulp drinking, Facebooking, obese. All of these things are a problem. But what we also are is the most technologically savvy and advanced as a civilization that we've ever been. And my 17-year-old's even better than I am. So the flip side of the negatives that we were talking about this morning is how ubiquitous technology has become. But healthcare is kind of the last frontier for patients on, this, on the engagement side. So I want to spend just a few minutes, just like Dr. Gerard did, kind of talking about some of the things that I see technology bringing to patient engagement, what's being worked on, and why I'm an optimist about how this is going to impact healthcare. So first, I want to talk about building out the last mile. We've talked about this a lot in telecom, right? They've got big fiber trunks. They're everywhere. But oh, wait, to get it to your house, you have to go negotiate with Time Warner and AT&T and pay out the nose. So the, the last mile problem is not a new problem. We have it in healthcare technology, but we have it in a different way. I think of the last mile as that space in between your doctor's visits. What technology has the potential to do is to keep us connected to our providers when we're not with our providers. Because let's face it, what do we do? We go in, we have our appointment, we talk about our problem, we get our prescription, we go home. Six months later, we go back and we pray things are better. Right? I mean, that's a lot of how we interact with the system. We have technology now, mobile. Think about your cell phone for a second here. How many of you have tried the iPhone application that tracks your sleep? You used to have to go. I'm not trying to out you for apnea, OK? I'm just saying you used to have to go to a sleep clinic to get that data about your sleep patterns during the night. Now there's an app for that that you can download on your iPhone, put it on your bed, wake up in the morning, you've got data on how you slept that night. That's completely amazing. We couldn't do that five years ago. Health information exchange. We are now capable of making sure that your record is at the ER when the ambulance gets there with you in it. Now, that's not perfect. It's not finished. It's a work in progress, like a lot of the things we're going to talk about. But it's a real technology. It's not tomorrow. It's today. And that is something consumers should be demanding, that their information be available to them and available to their providers not by fax and not by paper, but electronically. And, and not on Facebook, although I'm fairly sure, again, that's what my 17-year-old is going to do with his medical record. Finally, remote and home monitoring. Dr. Gerard touched on this a little bit. We have the technology to wrap a lot of healthcare services around people in their home that used to have to be delivered at a facility. Now, why is that important? The research tells us that particularly Folks, as they get older, folks with chronic conditions, almost every speaker today talked about their mother. I'm going to talk about mine. My mother had an acute episode. She was in the ICU for 21 days. When she finally went home, I made her wear a life alert. She didn't speak to me for two weeks. It was this ridiculous, intrusive thing around my neck. And then she fell. Then she started wearing it every day. We have all these technologies that can keep people at home because what we know about institutional care is it's a subliminal signal that your life is over. And that's how a lot of people take it, no matter how hard we try to make it better. So the promise of health information technology is wrapping around people in that last mile in their homes to keep them in their homes so when they finally do go to the hospital, it's for real reasons that the real professionals at the hospital can then address. Um, See, I'm short, too. I've got all these things. Oh, the user experience. This is my favorite thing to get excited about. I know Facebook, at times, is the scourge of the earth. I get it, especially if you've got minors living in your household. It's a real challenge to monitor and work with. But think about what they'll do for a like on their Facebook post that they won't do for you. <laughs> OK, how huge is that delta? It's massive. So what we're starting to see is games and social media being used to increase things like compliance with medications. I want to see somebody build a game that gives you points for brushing your teeth. I know that sounds simple, but let me tell you, if we could get kids to do that as much as they're doing Instagram, we would save ourselves billions of dollars down the road. So it's taking the information, taking the compliance, putting it in front of the patient in a format, in a medium, 
that they're already happy and comfortable and familiar with. We're really starting to see results with this being tried across the country. It's incredibly exciting because it takes it out of that lecture mode, which we all want to get into when we're frustrated when we see that people aren't complying. We all know that lecturing tends to really not get you what you want most of the time. Person, family, and caregiver-centric records. I think this is another piece that's really important. I do a ton of public speaking on health information technology. The number one question that I get after a speech is from someone who'll come to me and say, look, I live in Austin, my mother's in a nursing home in Florida, my sister's in Atlanta, my uncle's in New York, I have to call the charge nurse every day, she hates me, she's tired of talking to me, why aren't you helping me? Where is the app? that will tell me when she's had an episode, tell me what her blood pressure is, tell me she's taking her medications. Where is it? I'm dying, I'll pay for it. The people who bridge those gaps, the family gap, the caregiver gap, really making a personal electronic health record, are going to change the world as far as how we consume and work with healthcare. Because let's face it, not only do we have to work with the challenge of the baby boomers getting older and moving into the retirement system, I'm a huge fan of the baby boomers because y'all have changed healthcare forever. You want to live forever, you want to look good while you're doing it, and you want to have sex as long as you can, and you have revolutionized healthcare forever. You laugh. But it's a very real thing. And those ripples haven't started to hit the long term care system. And when they do, it will be technology that helps get folks to the place they want to go in their own home with their surfboard or their dirt bike or whatever it is that makes them happy. Engaging the tech community, last, last really major point. Austin is such an amazing place to live and work because we have this incredible entrepreneurial spirit. But I've actually had tech incubators tell me, uh, oh, health IT, yeah, we don't do that, that's hard. And it's, it's healthcare, that's complicated. And Medicaid, oh, no, I might as well be a vampire. I want any part of it. That is starting to change. We're really starting to see success with incubators and accelerators. And what that brings to the conversation is application makers and application developers that know how to build tools for people, for consumers, tying those things into healthcare in a very entrepreneurial, creative sort of way. So with the medical school coming online, there's all this wonderful conversation and opportunity to start leveraging that community to solve some of our pressing problems. I mean, I think it's great that I can track my shoe wardrobe on my iPhone. But again, I'm looking for that toothbrushing app. And I want that to be number one downloaded in the you know, preteen set on the iPhone store. Also, we're starting to see data being opened up to developers. And this is where I'm really going to geek out for a second, but this is super important. There are companies, payers, healthcare providers who are putting data sets online so developers can play with them. There are competitions and challenges happening all over the United States where a data set might get released around nutrition or around personal health, and application developers are having at it, seeing what kind of creative solutions they can come up with. Not all of that stuff's going to go to market, but some of it is potentially really, really game-changing. What all of these things really do is they're going to take patient data and turn it into an actionable step instead of the patient data being passive in some place that just sits in relation to the patient. I'm not saying the healthcare data is all passive. Payers are working with it, government's working with it, Dr. Commissioner Janik's working with it. I'm talking about from the patient perspective, taking that data and making it an active thing. So does any of this stuff work? I just want to show you one slide. The landmark study from the Veterans Administration on the use of home monitoring for patients with chronic conditions had some un believable outcomes. 20% reduction in hospitalizations right off the top. If this was a drug, you'd be demanding it right now. And you would be irritated if your loved one didn't get it. And we should be thinking about these sorts of technologies in the same sort of way. People should be asking, can I be at home? Is there technology that can support me to be at home? That's the exciting component. Because I'll tell you the other thing about the VA study, using the remote technologies at home kept the patient and their family more engaged. It wasn't passive waiting for the home health nurse to show up. It was active. Every day I've got to go up and do things to keep myself engaged in my health care. So this is the landmark study. You can find it online. Totally read it. It's really great. 
So I think you can tell I'm an optimist, and I have a great future in stand-up comedy when I'm done doing policy work. But I want to close with my favorite quote. I love people who, who frame their speeches that way. Because I am an optimist about the American healthcare system, and I like to, to refer to our dear friend, Winston Churchill, <laughs> and always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. We heard this this morning, didn't we, from the panelists? We've done IPAs, we've done HMOs, we've done all of these things. The era of the patient is the era that is coming. And just like Dr. Gerard said, it's the technology that's the tool, but it's the patient that's the center and the key that's going to make all this stuff happen and get us to the places we need to go. So with that, I'm going to close. My father is a 32-year practicing family uh, physician. And watching him over the last five years kind of go into retirement or try to go into retirement, someone that was passionate about the thing that he did his whole life now hates it. Now, maybe he doesn't hate everything about it. He still loves patients, but he hates everything else. Uh, and that's because he works for a large system who forced him in, into an EMR and e-prescribing e and things that long term are the right thing for medicine, but in the short term do not work into a physician's workflow. They do not benefit physicians in the short term. Long term, it's the right thing for medicine. It just maybe wasn't done the right way, uh, especially for the family practice providers who have to see a large number of patients. Um, so when I saw or I met the founders of DocBook, this idea that they had, um, kind of what Nora discussed and, and, and Dr. Greer mentioned, which is technology is already there. The technology to connect physicians and make workflow for them a little bit easier is already there. Uh, we just have to use it. Um, and so you know, DocBook isn't available on a PC. So the only way you could ever use our product, and we'll show you in a second, is on a mobile device, on an iPhone, iPad, Android, tablet. And there's a reason for that which is we could have easily and probably more cheaply done it on a PC, which is we wanted to put a product into physicians' hands to go at the point of care. So they could go between patients and connect with other physicians, talk about patients securely, meeting HIPAA requirements, exchange an x-ray, send an EKG, anything they wanted to do. Uh, and, and nowadays, of course, these stats change every day, but you know, the predominant device now is a smartphone. Almost everyone in this, I was sitting up there earlier, Almost everyone in these chairs has an iPhone and an iPad, I think, actually. Uh, I have a mini. Uh, I know John has a mini right there. I think we all have iPhones. Um, so why don't we use the device that every physician already has? And not only do they have it, but they use it, and they like to use it, or they wouldn't have personally bought it. Uh, so, but why, why does mobile work for that? Well, there's a the simplicity to it, right? So every two years, you upgrade your contract. You get rid of your phone for the next iPhone. It isn't a huge event. It isn't as if you know, St. David's has to buy all technology for all new physicians. It's, it's kind of a natural ecosystem to get the latest hardware into the hands of providers or practicing physicians. Uh, quick app development cycle. So why is mobile? It's not the answer for everything. And, and Dr. Greer showed you there's so much that technology can do that DocBook doesn't play a role in at all. It's just a small piece of connecting physicians. Uh, but if you, if you look at the last six months, so I actually met with John in St. David's to show them what DOPBO could do for doctors six months ago. And what's in the app today and what we'll release in the next two weeks were features that we didn't even think of when we met with them six months ago. They weren't even on the table. The technology, we, the idea wasn't even born yet. Yet they're already developed, they're done, they've been tested, and now they're in the app. So that development cycle where we fixed it we found it, we came up with an idea, we tested it, and we put it in 16,000 users' hands all within the last few weeks or, or month. Makes, makes you make that leap of, well, if we can keep up with technology, if mobile can be that first frontier where physicians can you know, fit into their workflow, maybe we can leave the real technology uh, behind the scenes to really do the hard, heavy lifting and the hard work. Um, so why? Why does DocBook, so one of the things that we do that's, that's probably different than, than most competitors out in the spaces uh, is we actually partner with medical societies. So across the United States, we've partnered with 300 medical societies. We partner with the TMA here in Texas, all of the county medical societies. Uh, we've done this in 32 states, and there's a reason. Well, two reasons. One is our physician founders believe in advocacy. Uh, we are a physician-funded, founded, and run company. Uh, we, we definitely seek to make revenue and profit, but it's not our fo total focus um, to our avail sometimes. Uh, but why we do that is we believe that if you connect the community of physicians, then they will treat patients, not the other way around. 
Uh, and so we partner with the medical societies because they bring us that entire network of physicians in a county or in a state. And we put them in the app together, so it becomes a great virtual directory where two doctors can find each other, call each other, or electronically send text messages, images of EKGs, a picture of a lab, anything you want in real time while, while being HIPAA secure. This information can then go on and be documented into your EMR. You can securely fax it and put it into the patient chart. You can do anything you want with it, but we, we put it into your, work, your workflow, and physicians can choose to adapt to it in the way that they want to adapt to it. Um, so there is physician-centered apps, and that's one really amazing frontier on, on uh, technology, and it's not just DocBook. You've got Hippocrates, you've got UpToDate, you have tons of new mobile technology that come out every day. They get updated every day with the latest and greatest, uh, and I think we're just seeing the beginning of what people can create. Um, but something that Nora mentioned, we're seeing a crossroads now, and patient-centered apps are actually becoming more popular. There's more development money and time going into patient-centered apps. That is really wonderful for patients, that chronic, chronic disease management, self-monitoring, even education, just simply knowing what allergy you have or, or why your kid is sick. But what's more important is who knows what that intersection means long term. What it could mean is I could have my vitals sent securely to my physician via DocBook. We haven't done that, but there's no reason why we couldn't because now we've got two parties who have secure technology uh, on both ends or secure hardware that we can now connect. Uh, no one's making that connection right now. Certain, certain people are trying. Uh, but, but ultimately, you see the vision that can be there is, is everyone can get to the app that they want. They can adapt to the technology they want. They may want Angry Birds, and they may want to deal with diabetes, but it's their choice. Uh, we can give them incentives and, in the right way, connect them to physicians who want to treat, with them, treat them in that way. Um, what's next for mobile apps? So it, unfortunately, you can't see it under there. Um, but once you build this frontier, once you put this tool into physicians' hands and connect them, all you can do now is leverage it. Uh, and so something that DocBook is doing, and uh, I think the gentleman up there in the corner mentioned the, the ATA conference here in Austin. I think it's next week, May 5th through the 7th. Uh, Nora has invited us to be in a startup section. Uh, but we are actually also announcing a huge partnership with a telemedicine company. And one of the reasons we're doing that is we now have this platform where 16, 20,000 physicians around the country are connected electronically. Well, now we can do mobile radiology, mobile PACS viewing, you know, three-dimensional FDA-approved viewing of full x-ray reports on a mobile device, on an iPad. So physicians don't have to find a PC in the corner of a hospital, find a login, uh, get logged out immediately, or go home, you know, go back to their office to see you know, a full uh, pathology workup. They can get snippets or a lot of that data directly on their mobile device, or at least be alerted that it's available. In today's world, you order a stat read on a radiology, someone's got to track you down to let you know it's available. So that's time and that's money in the healthcare system. Um, so DocBook is one, one small piece of technology, but I think it's going to have a, a huge effect, the mobile technology. I wanted to spend a few minutes, uh, just my few minutes today, talking about something in healthcare that I think most of us forget, something that I think most of us have kind of grown numb to, but that's, I believe, really the one thing that's going to make a huge difference in the world. But before I, before I go to healthcare, I want to, I want to take us back. And I, I see a few young faces in the room. Um, no, no, it's, it's okay. I, I, won't, I won't rat anybody out, but everybody knows what that is, right? Now, you young folks, believe this or not, you used to actually get a piece of paper out and you laid this on a little block, and you slid this thing across your credit card. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Right? Now, and when you did it, what did you have to do when you got your statement? You had to really look at your statement, because guess what? Somebody took that piece of paper, they mailed it in, and somebody in some big room sat down and typed that piece of information in, and they messed up. And so you'd get a credit card bill with something that, that uh, wasn't what you bought, it wasn't the right amount, it, it, and you'd have to go through this dispute process with the credit card company. How many of us actually really detailed look at our credit card bills anymore? Okay, there you go. So good for you. <laughs> <That's>, um, <clears throat> there you go. Well, that, you got to watch those. That's right. But the reality is those are very much few and far between than what they used to be. 
right? Because we have these devices everywhere. We have these scanners and we have this electronic transmission capability that allows us to get that transaction from our card to our bank instantaneously and correctly 99.9% .9 of the time, minus the fraud charges you get occasionally. Um, well, here's the thing. Data is what drives all of that, isn't it? And we've kind of forgot with all the great things that we have in front of us. I spend my day with technology. I spend my day with new technologies, new devices, new things that we need to be using to make healthcare better. But the thing that we often forget is behind all of that is this thing called data. Now, I'm not going to use the big data term because we've all gotten tired of big data. I'm, I call it data piles. We just got piles of data. Um, the reality is, as a healthcare system, we're collecting millions of transactions a day. 20 million patient visits a year just with our system. Tons of information. Now, when you take that and you start looking at what's in there, what is that information really telling us? The reality is it's just piles of data, right? So we use this great term, we call it big data, and, and that's, that's kind of the buzzword right now. It's big data, and what are we going to do with big data? Well, the reality is to me, data is just noise. It's just a big bucket of noise. And unless you can take that data and create, create some resonance with it, you can create something that seems to get in sync and seems to start finding things that make a difference, it's always just going to be data. It's not going to do anything for us. Think about what the credit card companies have done since a few years ago. Your bills come with special offers, right? Um, they can now... They can now tweet you, they can text you offers to try something. You're in a certain area, hey, this is a great restaurant for you. Other people like you have done X. Wouldn't you like to partake? They've learned how to take this data and look at it, look at it globally, and then narrow it down to you specifically. Here's a great story. One day about six months ago, I got this phone call on my cell phone. I didn't recognize this number. It was an 800 number, and I don't usually answer those, but I answered it. And it was my credit card company. And they said, are you on Long Island? I said, nope, in Austin right now. And they said, somebody just bought something on your card. We're going to cut the transaction off. We're going to reissue you a card. Don't worry about it. Now, that, that, that's really nice. That's great. I appreciate them doing that. But then I went back and looked at the statistics. The smallest credit card company in this country Amex has 50 million customers, 50 million cards. MasterCard did 58 billion transactions last year. How in the world can they know that John Mason wasn't in Long Island? It's because they're looking at the data, they're looking at patterns, and they're looking at things that say, we need to watch this. Now, I'm not here to talk about the credit card industry. That's not what this is about, but I, I just wanted to correlate it. Imagine what we can do in healthcare. One of the things that, um, that most of us have probably faced someone in our family having at some point, and if not, you have a good possibility of it, is something called sepsis. Sepsis, it's a terrible thing. 750,000 cases of sepsis in this country every year. Anywhere from about 38 to 50% of the people that get septic die. Now, how do we know when you become septic? I'm not a doctor, so I, I, I did stay in a Holiday Inn Express, but I'm not a doctor, but I did go read. How do I know? Okay, you have, a you have a temperature that's over 101. You have an increased pulse rate. You have an increased respiration. You have a white blood cell count that has gone up, and you have some indication that there must be an infection. But by the time you diagnose that it's sepsis, you're already on the downward spiral. We're already on the way down. And so... Literally, almost 50% of the people that get that don't make it. So what if we were to now take all this data, much like the credit card industry did, and much like other industries, and we were to start collecting this? So we're in a hospital, and we're now connecting patients to monitors in the ICU that are capturing information constantly. Well, if you've got 20 million patient visits a year, or you've got however many patients, and you gather enough data, you're going to start seeing patterns. I believe this. I think in our lifetimes, we will have new vital signs that we've never thought of. 
new vital signs. Today we do height, weight, blood pressure, and we do now, my doctor puts the little thing on for your oxygen saturation, right? That's our vitals. There'll be new vitals because there is so much information now that if we start looking for the patterns and we start looking for the commonalities, we're going to be able to look at people and say 12 hours in advance of them going septic, it's coming. Let's do something now. And that's the goal. That's the whole point behind all of this, right? All of these tools, they're not just because they're cool. It's because it's supposed to help us make people healthier, make them live longer, save their lives. And that all comes, all of the advances we have came because there was data behind it. Um, so in the, in the scope of talking about our families, I'll go to my daughter. How about that? My daughter's a, uh, my daughter's a type 1 diabetic. She was diagnosed at five years old. Um, she's on a pump today. She's on a piece of technology that basically replicates her pancreas. She lives a normal life. You'd never know that she didn't have, that she had it if she didn't tell you. But I can tell you, and when my grandfather came out of medical school in 1933, she would have gone to a ward in a hospital and she would have laid there until she died. The only way we got to where we are today is because people had access to data. They had access to the information, they could do the research, and they could find things and they could figure out ways to save lives. She'll get a new pancreas someday, I hope, something. But if we can stop things like sepsis, if we can stop diseases in their tracks before they happen, and if we can recognize things before they're actually taking place, we're going to change lives. Look, we're way smarter than the financial industry. We can do this. But what it takes is all of us participating, giving this information, putting efforts towards looking at that information and doing something with it. I'll leave you with this. You know, if there was a point that I'd want to make is, um, it's, it's difficult in the healthcare industry, just like we talked about. Doctors have a workflow. They have a way they like to work. But there's a reason that this is changing, and it's a great thing. And so we really want to encourage our doctors, change your workflow. Learn to work with this data because it's going to make a difference. You know, I can't imagine how we could make a difference in the credit card industry if we were still doing it like we were 30 years ago. Couldn't do it. So we've got this great opportunity, and that's to me is the encouragement of all this whole day is that we're talking about health care and we're talking about ways to make people's lives better. So leave you with that. Thank you. So we're going to jump in with audience questions pretty quick, so get your questions ready. But I, I wanted to just start us off. You know, I was going to ask about how we were sure this was all for the patient. And I'm pretty convinced after hearing the four of you that this really is patient-centered. So I want to talk for a minute about trust. You know, we're at a time when Twitter, uh, Twitter handles get hijacked. We're at a time where patients really have no way to know how much their health care actually costs. Um, we're at a time when our credit card numbers get stolen and we get alerts that, you know, the state has released you know, millions of social security numbers by mistake. How are we, even if all of this is so patient-centered, how are we supposed to trust that, that you all are going to protect our data, that you're going to protect our medical records, that we are safe in your hands? Well, I'll take that one on first. I think there's two <laughs> components to, to the trust piece. Number one, when you ask patients who they trust, number one is still the physician, because that physician-patient relationship is still sacred. So where distrust comes is when they sense someone's between them and their doctor, be it the insurance company or the data mining company or whoever it is. That, that makes people nervous, so that's number one. Number two, I think, and again, you know, we've been joking about our families, but if you raise a child, you learn, and they learn, if there's no consequence, they repeat the bad behavior. So somebody earlier commented, I think pretty appropriately, that wow, you're talking about lots of disincentives and lots of negatives. The flip side of the trust piece to me is consequences for negative actions. There was a news story just today. This is gross, but you'll never forget it ever. <laughs> um, some people in New Zealand released um, pictures of a patient that had an incident with an eel. And that's all I'm gonna say. 30 people got reprimanded and a bunch of them got fired because it was just too good. They just had to tell someone. Well, we can't do that. And if there's not consequences for that sort of thing, when someone violates a patient's trust, especially something so personal, so horrific, I want all 30 of them fired if I'd been in charge. They all would have lost their jobs. So there has to be two pieces. The physician-patient relationship still has to be in place. That's, that's super important. And then I'm, I'm a huge believer in this particular framework 
in really severe penalties for misuse. Like you can't beat the credit card people up enough or the fraudsters, I don't know that they get punished enough, but if someone mis abuses a patient's trust, I just, I'm very draconian about it. I think there should be really severe penalties because you can't pull that back, right? They could cancel his credit card but that person in New Zealand, which I'm sure half of you are going to Google when you leave, they're never going to get that back. So it's a much higher threshold. And I think that that's, that's something very serious that we have to all take very seriously. I'll get off my soapbox, but I just think that's really well, I, I, would, I would add to this, too, is, you know, you often talk about in a lot of businesses, a lot of the fraud comes from the inside. Um, what you do find, however, in a lot of cases with healthcare is it isn't from the inside because the people that are taking care of you they get that. Um, it, is, it is the unfortunate part of our world of the people from the outside that just want to cause problems and, and do damage. A big part of my job is security. Uh, I spend a big part of my time on that. Um, we take it serious. And so I think that is, that's something that people are more comfortable with uh, over time. You know, my, my mother won't use an ATM machine still because she's pretty convinced there's something wrong with that. But um, you know, on, buying things online and doing things, that's just, uh, it, it is something that we're become more comfortable with. The difference is teaching people the boundaries, right? The, the Facebooking somebody's picture, you've got to change the society's view of the boundaries of what's appropriate. Anyone want to jump in or should we open it up? Let's just see, does anyone uh, yet in the audience have questions? Anyone, anyone? Mammy, there's a, I think I'm... Back in the equation, every time you seem to create something new, it's added cost and cost for whoever developed, I mean, profit for whoever develops it, all of that, but then it doesn't get rid of the cost that it was supposed to replace. So how does the new technology help in the cost issue? Right. Uh, gr great question. And, and, and I would say that as a, as a, as a technology developer now, uh, I and our team, and I think most teams, are cognizant of the fact that uh, we have to develop technology not for technology's sake, but technologies that will be useful because they can be affordable and given to patients. And again, I am fundamentally a clinician. I have been. I was born that way, went to medical school. I still think that way. Let me give you an example. The new technologies for vaccines uh, uh, that we're doing in College Station, uh, to create the capability of 50 million doses in four months even six years ago, the same capability just to build the factory and get it up and running at another big center was over a billion dollars and took eight years. Because of the new technology that we've done, our center will take three years and it's $91 million. Now, that is not only a drop of $900 million to get the center up, but just think of it. If you were a pharmaceutical company and every time you wanted to try to make a new product, it cost you a billion dollars to make that factory, you would only take the minimalist risks to get the minimalist indication to make the minimalist benefit because you want to make a profit on that. So to me, I'm really thrilled we've dropped it by $900 million, but what it means is the pipeline for cancer, for HIV, for TB, for all these things are going to open because the amount of investment for each product has to go down. Again, that's only one example. But it, it, because we only have time to give a few, but just about everything I said has a real cost containment piece of it. Some of it may be more money out front, like restoring two bionic arms to a 19-year-old may cost $100,000 or $150,000 up front, but it saves you, hun yeah, not hundreds, it saves you millions of dollars in long-term care and coordination. Chuck, who uh, uh, was a guy on one of my slides, uh, he's from New Hampshire. His first day out of high school, he became a lineman for the county. He put both arms on a hot wire and lost both of his arms when he was uh, the day after he finished high school. His complaint now that he's uh, uh, in his early 40s, since he's got his new bionic arm, is that his wife is making him do household chores around the house again. <laughs> so, uh, but your point is well made. And again, I said we have to make it affordable. A lot of the things I've talked about, and specifically what we're working on, uh, we want to drive costs down. Uh, the new plant-based vaccine technologies that we're also pioneering, we are making vaccines. We have shown that we can make a flu vaccine, and this is not approved. You won't get it next year for a penny a dose using that manufacturing technology. 
So a lot of these are to drive the cost down because, again, the end is not the technology. It's for the patient to benefit, period. Just a man in the back. Right there? Uh, just drawing on the, the trust concept, I'm just wondering about th this whole privacy idea and just me personally, but pr I work on behalf of survivors of domestic violence, so there's a lot of information in people's health records that aren't, that are social determinants of health and that's something you might have shared with one physician seven years ago, but you might not want your allergist to know or ask you about. So, and so this idea of just um, all of these data points just zooming to the next practitioner that you're in front of and them having all that information seems a little bit scary. And it, or it seems like something that patients need to know that anything that's ever happened to you that when you interface with the medical community mm -hmm. is available to everyone that you'll ever see in the medical community. Is that where we have to be or it's just, it's just really hard privacy-wise to think about all of it. Well, I, let me, I'll, I'll start, and then I think they've got some thoughts, too, is that's actually, that actually does, isn't the way it's designed. Um, it, you know, in the systems, and, and there's laws around this, there's regulations that people can only have access to patients they're in direct care and information that is, is based on what they're going to treat. Um, so I, I, I don't want to mislead in at least what I said, that there's just this massive amount of data of everybody just flowing around and everybody can see it. Most of the time when you talk about the data that I was talking about, it's what they call de-identified data. So it's, it's the data points. It might be ages and things like that, but it's, it's not necessarily identifiable. We, we take a lot of efforts to de-identify and worry about protected health information. Um, so. I think that's a great point, though. That is a concern, right? You don't want to just open it up. Even in, our, even in our system, you can't, as a physician, just go see anybody's record. You've got to be in their care chain. You've got to have those permissions. So um, I, I think there's a lot of protections there for that. I, I want to follow up just um, with a mention. You hear a lot of talk about HIPAA, which is the most poorly understood law, I think, in the history of regulation. Texas has its own health data privacy law. Chapter 181 of the Health and Safety Code. Our law is stricter than HIPAA. It covers more entities that hold patient data. It's got stricter penalties. And um, we have our own ability to be an enforcer as a state against entities the federal government doesn't even regulate. So last legislative session, the legislature passed House Bill 300, which was considered a landmark in patient privacy protection. My favorite article about it literally had the title, wow, it looks like they mean it. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course we mean it, this is very serious. So in no way am I making light of your concern for the folks that you work with. It's a very serious issue and I just wanna tell you on behalf of the, the legislature and the regulators in Texas, since HIPAA started over a decade ago, they've always felt the federal framework was inadequate. We've always had our own framework that's stronger I get complaints about it from doctors and hospitals and other folks because they have to deal with two sets of regulations, and that's a fair complaint, but it puts patient privacy first, and I think that that's very important. The woman in the back. This is for uh, Mr. Gerard. You were talking about bringing down the cost and the cost and efficiencies and so on like that. Uh, What's the possibility of a study being done, because I think it would drastically reduce the uh, uh, cost to the patients of the equipment, the efficiency of the equipment, the uh, profit, so on like that. And I guess the real root of the question I want to ask you, being at Texas A&M, I consider that to be public information, public invention. But will this be going to private industry where they will be able to patent it? Because in using in our family a CPAP machine and the lymphedema pump over 20 years, I have seen the cost of that just expand exponentially. But yet the technology within ma the machine is basically the same. They've just been able to reduce the size of the machine. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, well, there be patents on what, the, like the vaccine and other things that you're developing okay, at so A&M. There, 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 there are a variety of, uh, of questions here, right? So yes. um, being in a public sector, either from UT Southwestern, where I was before, or Texas A&M system, um, there, there's a relatively uh, clear pathway that when inventions are made that are made on state, that are made on state money, that the state owns, the state owns those inventions. Okay, they own them and then they're licensed out to companies, uh, either the, either A&M may start a company or they're more typically they're licensed out to other companies and then the state institution benefits from that. So there, there is a, a, a good process and again, you're seeing more and more that that's happening in order to protect the state's interest based on the investment that they have made and, and, and it's, it's ubiquitous and I think that process is going well. Um, in, in terms of cost, I will just, I will just make one, uh, one comment that may be related or may not be, but I think it is and I want to make it anyway, is that um, uh, much of the cost of, of new devices or new uh, therapies are in the last phase, which is called a phase three trial. Uh, these are really brute force trials with thousands of patients, enormous amounts of regulation. They are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in order to do that. And uh, I want to just play off everyone here is that one of the big challenges is to use big data, and I will use that in a way that we can lower the cost but also speed the bringing of safe therapeutics to patients who need that. And, and I think one of the big challenges, and it's not a technical challenge, it's an information challenge, is how to do clinical trials uh, not just with bigger brute force in a thousand places, but to do them more smartly so that if a patient uh, who's dying with cancer today can get that therapy six, eight, ten years earlier, and you'll see a dramatic cost reduction. So a lot of us in our own little piece is working on that. There's a data piece. There's a physician-to-physician -physician communication piece on that. Um, there's clearly pieces of everything you're spoken about, and there's a tech piece, too. Any others? We probably have time for one more out there. Yes, ma'am. There's a, a mic coming your way. For the gentleman at HCA, so I've been working in healthcare data all my professional career. So I wanted to, wanted to know, what do you find the most challenging from a data perspective? Is it the claims processing? Is it the data that integrates to the hospital systems? Is it the data systems that are going to analyze a practitioner behavior? What is going? What do you think is the most challenging today and um, costly? Because the comment about HIPAA, I remember working in an organization and we had to. X12 came out, and it's this new system that we had to create and develop, and software that we had to buy to, you know, help process the claim. Before it was, here's the submission, here's the claim. Now it's all this clever code involved, and we bought the application. Oh, that's not going to fit on your server. You have to buy a server. The server cost us now. So we just got hit with the software cost, and now we get hit with the server cost. So what are some of the challenges that you're seeing as far as, you know, taking that all that data? Because I think a lot of people don't really understand that. Yes, we get the data, but that data is integrated into, you know, six to seven different systems, and it's right. extremely costly. Right, that's and a great. And it impacts cost. It does. That's cost. a great question. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would have told you it was, um, it was integration. It was getting our data to look like someone else's data and making it talk. A lot of that's gone now. Um, you know, it is, the, the data is pretty good now. We can, we can get data between places. Um, where, where I find the biggest challenge is there are so many vendors now that uh, people out there that want data, that want to pop up and get access to that, and I have to take into account, first and foremost, the privacy and security of that information. Um, and so as we proliferate, and then, and then, I, then I also would say it's kind of the, um, the appleization of the world, right? Uh, everyone feels like, well, it's mm -hmm. si simple. It's just on an iPad. Why can't I have it? And, and, and for most things, I would say that is true very easy, but when we're talking about such sensitive information and such volumes of it, um, it, it isn't quite as simple as, as people would like it to be. So there's grown to be this expectation that I should have it on my iPhone. And there are certain things. We can do vital signs and we can do things with our patients, but the kind of things that people want to do uh, are much deeper and more complex than that. And so, um, you know, I guess you could take the attitude of just, just give them the information, but, but we don't because we take it so serious. So I, I would say kind of back to your question is it's no longer about the, the integration or the design of the data anymore. We're, we're pretty good standards. 
It's the how do I be sure where it's going that they have the right protections in place. They're a, they're a going concern as a vendor. They're going to give us information. Is it the right information? Do we understand what it means? And um, it takes a great deal of time to make sure you do that right. So it, it gives the appearance of being slow. Um, but I, I often tell people I'm slow on purpose. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, please help me thank our wonderful panelists.